Hi, welcome to Field Sports Britain and the Ballywalter Game and Country Living Fair. I'm Paul Pringle. This estate dates from the golden age of country sports, from punt guns to black powder. That's the theme for this year's fair as well. Let's see what's happening. The estate has a great sporting history and during the season offers some fantastic high birds and I should know. And of course the custodians of this magnificent estate have enjoyed all sorts of shooting and fishing and Lord Dunleith is no exception. I believe you have a tremendously famous sporting history here. Yes, I mean my family were all great sportsmen, um, both field sports and otherwise. Um, there was also a pheasant shoot here. I don't think they took it terribly seriously. They seem to shoot about four times a year and the bags were something like ridiculous like sort of 800, 600, 400, 200 and then they stopped. I think the main reason why they didn't take their pheasant shooting seriously here then was that they had um, this amazing wild duck shoot down at Dan Patrick Marshes which was quite incredible and in any book of repute that sort of features wild shooting um, Dan Patrick Marshes features in it. What sort of bags would they have taken it? Well, of course, they're numbers which would probably be considered totally unacceptable nowadays, but, you know, three, four, five hundred duck shot in a day, starting with the dawn flight, and obviously geese and uh, snipe, and the odd woodcock, the odd pheasant as well. Um, you know, probably to eight or nine guns. To mark the golden age of field sports, let's kick off with a history lesson from a couple of very well-known fishing masters. Things certainly have changed in the equipment department, but what about the casting itself? Casting's pretty much the same oddly enough I and mean, everyone thinks oh we're doing things that are really different and they're not really I mean they had uh, pivotal casts that we're still using we had roll casts um, probably not as we know it but you have to remember that yes you're looking at, at a at basically modern technology at its, at its peak but back then there were great strides in development going on as well. You had split cane, which they never had before. They were using solid rods. Now they were splitting them. So there was this whole change. It was as much a sea change then as it is now. Glenda, you're a well-known international caster. In fact, a ladies' champion, if I'm right. Yes, I have done a few competitions in the past, yes. And what were you demonstrating today? Well, apart from, um, I was demonstrating double-handed casting and Charles was concentrating mostly on the single-handed rod, but I think in the arena situation, it's more that fishing is for everyone. It can be fun. Um, and you saw some helicopter casts and things in there, which are not of any use, but it does teach people um, the basics of casting and minting intention. And the magic question, which is more popular, trout fishing or salmon fishing? <laughs> Pass. <laughs> it's a very difficult one. Um, what a... Why doesn't yeah. everybody just go fishing? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the punt gun is also being demonstrated at Ballywalter, a piece of history rarely seen or talked about these days. Andy, this is an amazing piece of kit here. How did punt guns begin? Nobody really knows how, how punt gunning started, but people surmise that it was um, from back from the time of really sailing ships and men of war and uh, some innovative fowler started to adapt and use what was a stanchion gun, which was a muzzle-loaded, short-barreled weapon, obviously, for killing people, killing men. And uh, Gervais Markham wrote a book, and he said that when men went out of season, uh, fowlers looked to the prevention of hunger. And uh, that, that led to the development of punt guns as we know it, the more they started off obviously as muzzle loaders. The main gun makers obviously saw the potential and before the end of um, the 19th century, big names like Holland and Holland, Tolly, Bland were all making and producing different types of punt guns. What's the big excitement for you? Is it the thrill of the chase? It's, it's somebody described it as like deer stalking on water but you know when you're lying and it is very very physical and you're trying to hold the punt against wind and tide and you must keep it end on to, for the small small profile when you're approaching foul and you know your heart's beating off the off the duck boards you know you can it, it is it's, it's you know just a bit further a bit further a bit further you know 
In case there's any foul play today, Sherlock Holmes is also here. Just as well as during the Edwardian and Victorian period, field sports were the pastimes of the idle rich. At the other end of the spectrum were the poachers. Let's pretend that you've just been out uh -huh. and you've had a successful night. What sort of numbers are we talking about? Well, different grounds. I mean, Victorian times, pre-myxomatosis era, I read a court order from a Victorian book and the, and the poachers were caught on some ground that they shouldn't have been on, some Victorian long letters, and, and the judge asked for their, for their catch to be brought to the court and they had 350 rabbits in the gallows of the court. So that was pre-myxomatosis days. Now, it depends on the ground, really. We could get anything up to 75, 80 rabbits a night, depending on the ground. What was the penalty for getting caught? The penalty? I'm not sure. It depends on diff different laws in different periods in time, but certainly 18th century, further back, it would have been very, very, very strict indeed. Off to the colonies, maybe? Could if, have been. Could have been. If not if worse. So. Uh -huh. Worse, maybe not so for rabbits, but for other game, okay. certain poaching definitely would have been. Continuing on our theme of poaching, I have a person here with something just that little bit different, and it may well have been used in poaching. Richard, tell me about it. Well, as you can see, it's a walking stick. Uh, a gentleman like you could have went out for a walk and aided okay. you along your way. Right. And um, perhaps if you've seen a rabbit or something, maybe you could have you could have opened it up and it's a it's a gun as well. Yeah, it's a gun as well. You could have stuck around in it and what is that? Four ten? Uh, no, it's a point three sixty rifle. My so goodness. it was quite capable of taking a bit of game. Okay. The piper and the procession herald the official opening of the fair. It also means that some very special supporters of the event are having lunch as guests of Lord and Lady Dunleith, including the First Minister, Peter Robinson. Peter Robinson, First Minister, it's the first time we've seen you at Ballywater. Yeah, glorious day. The, the weather brings us all out, doesn't it? Uh, tremendous uh, event, good occasion, and uh, gives me an opportunity to to see how uh, people really enjoy themselves in the, the, the country. I'm being uh, a, a tiny. Uh, I'm not used to these things, although I do have a background uh, having lived in the, the country from my early years. I believe you're a bit of a fisherman. Yes, I, I, uh, I fish every time I get a, an opportunity on, on holidays, and uh, that's both deep sea and uh, indeed in the, the lakes uh, around where, uh, where I stay. But uh, I also uh, I breed fish uh, here at home, uh, koi carp. Uh, and it's a, it's a good pastime, I just wish I had more time for it. You've had a, a glimpse of the Ballywater Game and Country Living Fair and you've seen the thousands of people that are, are coming to it. Would you say it's a, a good message for people that are thinking about Northern Ireland, maybe even coming here for shooting or fishing? Well, it's a, it's a great advert for Northern Ireland. Uh, here we've got the, the weather and you've got the event. Uh, it seems a perfect combination. Uh, and people can see something of uh, rural life and uh, how people enjoy themselves in the countryside. Thank you very much indeed. That's all. One thing field sports and the game fairs have achieved is to put aside politics and religion and unite those who love the countryside. And Northern Ireland's Chief Constable, Matt Baggett, is well aware of that. Matt Baggett, Chief Constable, good to see you at Ballywalter Park. Thanks very much. It's, a, it's a great to be here and it's a fantastic day, isn't it? Have you seen round the game fair? I haven't yet, but I'm going to have a really good afternoon. I'm going to visit the exhibitions and try a few rods out, hopefully. Okay, you're a fisherman too? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Yes, well, since the age of four. Really? What? Trout? Everything that moves. <laughs> Canals, rivers, the sea, um, depending what the mood takes me, but I just love fishing. I think my job is to make sure that tourism works and uh, investment works. We can get the security situation in the right place and deal with the minority that want to take us back all the better. But, but the country fairs, game fairs, great afternoons like this afternoon, they're only good for Northern Ireland. Enjoy the game fair. Thanks very much. Also invited to the lunch were local councillors and local field sports supporter Jim Shannon MP. Do you reckon that the borough will be benefiting really greatly from everything that you see today? Absolutely. You know, uh, this time last year when uh, the Game Fairs of Ireland came in to throw this uh, Game Fair lifeline, uh, you know, we were absolutely delighted and we're overwhelmed this year mm -hmm. that we can add our support behind the game fair in Bally Walter. This estate in particular, I have to say, has been one that's been close to my heart. Uh, I come here with my son, uh, I, I did beating with him here, I was just into field sports here. Uh, he's now uh, uh, his own person, he's his own man, he does his own shooting, uh, but this, uh, I believe, Bally Walter endeared in him, uh, the culture of shooting, of respect for other people, uh, respect for the countryside, and respect for the quarry that we pursue. 
Well, from politics to ferrets. And that's not a sentence you hear very often. This is Ireland's Mr. Ferret, Tony Cairndaff. How many ferrets have you got at home? Uh, up to the minute, I would say 40. My that's goodness. roughly. Right, OK. But they're mostly babies. Those there will be ready to hunt in six months. My goodness. Mm -hmm. Tell me about your hunting. Uh, How do you do it? It's quite simple. <laughs> so we're, what we always say, we're bluffing those that are bluffing others. Just go down a hedgerow and sometimes if we have a dog and it would mark, it would, it would mark a burrow and we put the fret and then we ship them mostly. Yeah. You stand back about yeah. 30, yeah. 30 yards. Now these ferrets, they like it up too big because the rabbit can't bolt the same, it can hold it. Okay. Uh, this here we prefer because the rabbit can okay. trail the ferret out. That's, and that's why here he would kill one in seconds. In Victoria t Victorian times, would you have been a poacher? A warner. A warner. <laughs> okay. I'm a poacher now. <laughs> <laughs> one of the most popular shows in the arena is running and riding with the hounds and beagles. Today actually is the anniversary of our fight against the legislation to ban hunting in Northern Ireland, to ban snaring and against other field sports. We are asking everybody here to join the field sports organisation to help and defend the future of our sports in Northern Ireland. Do you stand for shooting and fishing or what is we it? We stand for all rural activities that are sustainable, good for the environment, good for the health and welfare of our animals and good for the health of our people. Well, thank you very much. We hope to see you at Change Castle. Thank you very much. Looking forward to be there. Thank you. From campaigning to cookery, we ask Emmett McCourt about cooking in the golden age of field sports, the Victorian era, and his Go For Game campaign. Well, back then, they probably had swan, they had the likes of magpie uh, and rook and that, you know. I take it there's no magpie in the menu There's no today. magpie in the menu today. Okay. You, you need a bit of permission, too, from the Queen to actually shoot the swan. <laughs> so, I mean, it's, it's all about sustainable local produce and go for game, you know. Was uh, the cooking very different in those days? Uh, not, not much, you know. Uh, I think it's come back to basics now, where, as I say, it's not mass-produced food. Uh, there's less uh, air miles, uh, less of a carbon footprint, you know. Uh, people are buying, you know, local produce again, you know. Uh, does it taste nice? It tastes beautiful, uh, lovely in fact. Uh, yeah. I see you're uh, heading up the Go For Game campaign. Yeah. What's that all about? It's about uh, sustainable local produce, sustainable game, uh, healthier options such as uh, pheasant and uh, venison, which is very lean meat, you know, and very, very healthy for you. Uh, so it's, it's very, very good. You know? Absolutely superb. Yeah. Now something we haven't seen yet, are the guns that would have been used in that golden age of country sports. So these are amazing weapons that you're using today to show the black powder shooting. What exactly are you using? Well, we're using, well, I'm using a reproduction. Uh, this, this, this gun I have is a, it's an American-made re reproduction. It's, uh, I've had it for 37 years, and I've been using it for demonstrations like this, but also for game shooting. I've shot pigeons, pe pheasants, parties with it uh, right, right throughout its life. Would you have as much confidence shooting with one of these antique weapons as with a modern gun? Well, I've never had a pigeon complain yet. <laughs> <laughs> We've talked about them. Now to the meeting of ancient and modern. Let's see if they work. Bally oh. Walter marks the start of the game fair season in Ireland. So after a busy weekend, what do the organisers think of the fair so far? Well, I think we've started a branding exercise with it. You can't brand an event or any sort of product in one year. But we've dipped our toe in the water. The house is a great Victorian backdrop to the fair. We've created some Victorian entertainment in terms of Sherlock Holmes players. And next year we hope to step that up a good deal. And so onward and upward to Shane's Castle in June. Yes, the next of the great game fairs of Ireland. You've been watching Field Sports Britain from Ballywalter Game Fair. If you're watching on YouTube, hit the subscribe button. I'll see you next time at Shane's Castle in June. I'm Paul Pringle.